Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart here be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in recent years, gender reveal parties have become very popular. Parties where the gender of a baby is revealed to the parents in some creative way. You know, it's amazing to think that until the 1970s, we couldn't know what the gender of a baby was going to be before it was born. Up until then, there were several ideas or myths about how you might be able to tell what the baby would be, but you never knew for sure. One of those myths was that if the father gained weight during the pregnancy, then the baby was going to be a boy. I'm trying to put those two things together, but if it was true, then we would have had all boys in our family. <laughs> For these gender reveals, people have done some pretty creative ways. A piñata with a confetti that reveals the, the gender of the baby. A cake where the color inside is pink or blue. There are also gender reveal fortune cookies, trivia questions, scavenger hunts. There's a variety of ways that people use to reveal the gender. Of course, then there's also the gender reveal gimmicks that have not gone so well. One couple used a helium balloon, but it sailed away before the balloon ever broke, revealing the gender. One dad broke his leg trying to cook a football that was supposed to break open and revealing the gender. Then there was the mother who was smacked in the face by a baseball hit by the father trying to reveal the gender. But perhaps the worst revolt results of a gender reveal involved fireworks that set off a 47,000 acre wildfire. I wonder what the gender color red reveals. How about a gender reveal angel? A gender reveal by the angel Gabriel. What if God sent a messenger to tell you not only what gender a baby would be, but surprise, you're going to have a baby. In our scripture passage today, we have perhaps the most important baby reveal in all of history. Not only that Mary would have a baby boy, but more important, the revelation telling her and us who this baby would be. God reveals by the angel Gabriel that the promised Messiah is about to be born. Well, but of course, before you can have a gender reveal, you have to have a baby reveal. And in this passage from Luke, it's revealed to Mary that she's going to have a baby. Now realize that for Mary, this makes one of the most joyous times in her life suddenly one of the most difficult. For a young Jewish woman, her upcoming wedding day would be one of the most joyous days ever of her life. It was a very notable occasion. The festivities took several days. Looking at the scripture from the wedding in Cana, we get a glimpse of how the celebration would be. And Mary is a young woman engaged to be married to Joseph, who's of the house of David. Now being of the house of David meant Joseph was of royal lineage, even if he was a simple carpenter in the small town of Nazareth. But then the angel Gabriel arrives with an ominous greeting. Hail, O favored one, the Lord is with you. This ominous greeting brings Mary more concern than joy. It's sort of like the Greeks that they said to the Trojans, hey, we got a present for you. Or maybe when the Boston inviting the British to a nice tea party sometime. But we see Mary's reaction to the angel's greeting. She is much perplexed at his greeting, pondering what these words mean. The Greek word for perplexed is used meaning great fear. Mary is very afraid, and we can understand her reaction. When God speaks directly with people, the greeting usually comes with life-changing results. Think of when God spoke to Abraham and sent him out of his land to a new promised land. Think of when God spoke to Moses and sent him to Egypt to rescue the Hebrew people. Mary is an insignificant young woman in an insignificant town of Nazareth. A town so obscure that they have to tell you that it's in Galilee. It probably only had about 500 people at that day. What does God want with her, she wonders. What life-changing news is contained in greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. The news that the angel brings 
only confirms her fears. She is to conceive a son and name him Jesus. Mary's world and all the joy she was hoping for with Joseph is suddenly turned upside down. She was engaged to Joseph, which meant they were committed to each other. In biblical times, they would have given official consent to be married, but were not married yet. And in biblical times, a legal engagement was as binding as a marriage. It could only be ended through a divorce. We can see the insight of how serious it would be taken for Mary to be with child when in Matthew, Joseph hears the news and decides to quietly divorce her. Gabriel's announcement to Mary about Jesus would not have brought her joy and gladness. No, she was afraid. She was greatly troubled. Consider Mary's situation. She's living in a small town, nowhere to hide. Everyone knows everyone's business. Her engagement to Joseph would have already been announced and now it would have been a divorce before it ever got started. And at the end of the day, Mary would have had a son to take care of with no way to provide for him. Mary's perplexity, her fear comes from feeling that God is calling her into a situation which she is completely unprepared for. A situation that will bring problems and difficulties to her life. The road ahead of her doesn't look joyful, but challenging. The path of Hedifer was changed from a bright future with Joseph to a difficult path she may have to walk alone. At some time in our lives, we will find ourselves called by God to serve him. We will feel called by God because that's what it means to be a disciple, to be a servant of God. For us, it will be a ministry reveal. God will reveal what he wants us to do. Now we can handle the ministry reveals that are easy, that fit within our comfort zone. Giving a person a ride to church, painting a house, serving a meal. There are many ministry tasks that we know how to do already without any disruption in our lives. But God may call us to a ministry that is outside of our comfort zone. Something we don't feel equipped for. And when God calls us for these challenging tasks, like Mary, we may suddenly feel inadequate, insignificant, not knowing how we can complete this task. We may wonder, who are we that the creator of the world is calling us to do this? And it's the tasks that seem impossible that leave us perplexed, that leave us afraid. Challenging ministry that takes us out of where we feel comfortable. We may be a ministry to share with someone your faith. You may be called to pray for a person, to help a stranger who is homeless, to sit with someone who's grieving. It's in those times that we may feel inadequate, small, not up for the task. God may also call us to do something that changes our life dramatically. Now Mary's calling totally upended her life. Our calling may, may not be quite as dramatic, but our fear may be just as real. We may find ourselves like Mary, much perplexed by God's calling. But contained within the greeting to Mary is the handle for her to hold on to when faced with this challenging task. Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. The word for favor here is the same word as for grace. Greetings, one full of God's grace, the Lord is with you. It's repeated in verse 30. Mary, you have found favor or grace with God. It is by God's grace and God's presence that Mary can fulfill her calling. The first thing God's grace does is eliminate fear. Gabriel says to Mary, do not be afraid. You have found favor or grace with God. God is present with Mary. And God's grace is with her to become the most important mother of Jesus. One of the most precious things for our humanity is to have a child. By God's grace, Mary will have a son and name him Jesus. Jesus means God is salvation. So in his very name will be a reminder of God's grace. 
The second thing God's grace does is bring the promise of the Messiah. There are two parts to the promise of the Messiah that Gabriel speaks about, the human portion and the divine. First, he announces the human side. He will be great, Gabriel says. What mother wouldn't be proud to hear the greatness of their child? Now, most parents are pleased to hear that their child will be great in some normal human accomplishment. They'll be great in whatever career they choose. They'll be great doctor or teacher or nurse or some other profession. Maybe they'll be a great business person or an entrepreneur. Maybe their greatness will come through being a service to the community, as a first responder, as a social worker. I can't name all the various ways, but most parents would be happy if their child is great and makes a contribution to society and is happy. The promised Messiah's greatness will be a little loftier though. It's outlined with three points. First, Jesus will be the Son of the Most High, we are told. The Most High in His exclusive name for the true God of Israel. Jesus will be the God of Israel. Second, God will give him the throne of David. He will fulfill the messianic promise set forth in Isaiah 9-6 that was read. Authority will rest upon his shoulder. That authority comes with the names Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the authority of God will grow continually and establish peace. And third, his kingdom will be established and last forever. This is the promise of the Messiah the nation of Israel has been waiting for. This is a greatness that Mary can hardly imagine. Hardly to imagine because Nazareth is so far from Jerusalem. It's unimaginable that a child from a small village like Nazareth could possibly become the king of Israel in Jerusalem. It's like a person from a small town dreaming they can become president of the United States. Abraham Lincoln's hometown was Hodgenville, Kentucky. Jimmy Carter's hometown was Plains, Georgia. Do you know what the smallest town in Wyoming is? According to Google, it's Hartville, Wyoming, with 62 population. Anybody been to Hartville? Okay, oh, the whole town is here. <laughs> Imagine living in Hartville, growing up in Hartville, and your parents tell you, one day you will be president of the United States. Jesus from Nazareth will be on the throne of David, and his kingdom will last forever. To counter against all the difficulties that God knows he's bringing Mary into, it is announced how great Jesus will be. He will fulfill the promise of the Messiah. Then Gabriel announces to Mary the divine side of the Messiah, how she will be bearing the Son of God. Mary wonders how it is possible for her to have a son. And Gabriel announces it is through God's gift, God's grace. God's Holy Spirit will come upon Mary. The power of the Most High will overshadow Mary. The image of God overshadowing Mary is an important connection to the incarnation of God in Jesus. In the Old Testament, when the tabernacle was built, the cloud of God overshadowed the tabernacle, and God's presence and glory filled the tabernacle. Here, God's presence and glory will fill Mary's womb in the child Jesus, and the child will be holy. The child's name will be called Son of God. Well, to finish answering Mary's question of how she could possibly become pregnant, Gabriel gives the sign of another miracle. Mary's relative Elizabeth, who is old, who was thought to be barren, is already six months along in her pregnancy. To answer Mary's question, how can this be? Gabriel gives the definitive response. Nothing is impossible with God. When we find ourselves wondering how we can be service to God, when we find ourselves called to serve and we feel inadequate, the task too big for us, when we ask God, how can you ask me to do this, we can rely on the promise of the Messiah, 
the promise of God's grace and God's favor, that nothing is impossible with God. When we hear a call to ministry, we can name many reasons why we can't do it, right? We're too old, we're too young, we don't know how, we don't feel comfortable, we don't like to do certain things, we don't understand completely, or maybe we understand too much. We know too much and think it's impossible. When we find ourselves wrestling with the calling from God, we don't have to wonder how we can do it, because we don't have to. God works through us to complete it. When God called Mary, he sent his favor and his grace upon her, and the Lord was with us, with her. When God calls us, God sends grace upon us as well, and God is with us through the Holy Spirit. Mary's response was to be a servant. Here am I, she said, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Mary had to wrestle with this message of the Lord from Gabriel. And it was only through wrestling with God's word that she became a servant of the Lord. When we are called to be servants of God, we also need to wrestle with God's word. God is with us through all of our doubts. When we are confident in God, when we can have faith and trust in God, then we too can be a servant of God. That's the promise of the Messiah. God is with us. God's favor and grace is with us. And with God, nothing is impossible. As the Messiah was revealed to Mary and allows her to serve in a very important way, may the Messiah be revealed to us this Advent season. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ, let us also prepare to, for the return of Christ by answering God's call to be a servant of the Lord. Amen.